Right. So this is, yeah, this is not my last lecture. I, I'm moving at a slower pace than I expected, so I ask for another lecture, which will be tomorrow. Um, so um, uh, let's recall um, what we did last time. Uh, so we talked about the state operator correspondence. Which relates a local operator to a state in radial quantization given by acting with that operator uh, on uh, the vacuum in radial quantization. Um, and we defined an interesting notion of conjugation um, that is natural in radial quantization, which is the image of. Uh, which maps a primary operator to its image under inversion up to some rescaling. Um, and we noted that um, uh, in uh, a reflection positive theory, uh, the conformal generators uh, transform in an interesting way under conjugation. So in particular, uh, D um, is anti-hermitian and uh, the conjugate of k mu is p mu. Um, and I just wanted to give an example um, of using these conditions to, uh, to do a computation that I think is also instructive for getting used to radial quantization. Um, so the idea is uh, let's look at a two-point function of primary operators. Um, and uh, so we can evaluate this in radial quantization. And um, I'll write one of them uh, in terms of uh, uh, Hermitian conjugate. So I'll start with the operator at some inverted point and then take the dagger. And then we have O of x, 0. Um, OK. Um, correlators in this form can be evaluated um, just using algebra. Uh, and the idea is, uh, is to write this as, um, so this is y to the minus 2 delta, 0. And then we know that uh, operators at, at some shifted point are just given by um, uh, exponentiating uh, the momentum. So this first operator is just this. Dagger. And then the next operator is e to the minus i p dot x o of 0 e to the i p dot x. And then the vacuum. Um, and now here we, use, we can use um, our funny uh, notion of conjugation to write this uh, in the following way. So the vacuum uh, in radial quantization, as we proved last time, uh, is invariant under all the symmetries. Yes? Th uh, thank you. So let me assume that O is, tr um, uh, yeah. Um, good. Um, let me assume that O is Fermitian. Um, good. So the vacuum is invariant under the symmetries. Um, so whenever we have something like this acting on 0, that's just 1. Um, and similarly, when we act to the left, that's just 1. Um, but uh, what we get is something, um, uh, so uh, we have uh, O of 0, um, dagger, uh, e to the i, y over y squared, now dot k because that came from um, uh, taking the conjugate of, um, uh, of this term. Um, and then e to the minus i p dot x o of 0 acting on the vacuum. And let me just call this thing cat o, this thing just cat o. Um, and now uh, um, exercise.
uh, expand out uh, the exponential to second order um, and show um, that um, there's only uh, one interesting term that appears. So this is y to the minus 2 delta. The leading term is just inner product of O with O. And then there's uh, y mu over y squared, x nu, O, k mu, p nu, O, plus dot, dot, dot. OK, so uh, I did very little going to that uh, line, but you should convince yourself that uh, that's, that's correct um, to this order. Um, and um, let's evaluate this thing uh, using the conformal algebra. So uh, because O is, um, uh, is primary, we can replace this product with a commutator. So the commutator contains two terms, but one of the terms is just 0 because k mu uh, acts on O to give 0. Um, and now this uh, we know from the conformal algebra. This is minus 2i um, delta mu nu times d minus m mu nu. Um, and sandwiched between um, uh, scalar states that um, have dimension delta, uh, this just gives uh, 2 delta delta mu nu. Um, so the result for our two-point function is y to the minus 2 delta uh, inner product of, oh, and right. So um, let's put the O's on the outside here. And so then we can just pull that out. So inner product of uh, O with O. And then the leading term is 1 plus 2 delta x dot y over y squared plus dot, dot, dot. Um, and you can check for yourself that this agrees with the leading order uh, expansion of what we know the answer to be. OK, so uh, the conformal algebra, um, this is another way of seeing why conformal symmetry fixes, completely fixes the form of two-point functions. It's because you can compute the two-point functions just using the algebra. And if, uh, if you feel up to it, um, uh, it shouldn't be that bad. Um, it, you, you may be able to prove that um, this thing just exactly gives rise to this, uh, uh, this two-point function. So, chordal distance. Um, so no, no, this is, I'm, this is a flat space uh, distance. OK, so um, uh, good. So, so using this, uh, it's, it's easy to understand why um, two-point functions are fixed using the conformal algebra. You can do a similar computation uh, using three-point functions um, and, and show, again, why, why they're fixed using the algebra. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a nice language, and it's useful to go back and forth between this kind of language and uh, the language we were using with word identities before. Uh, and we'll see an explicit of example of that uh, in a few minutes. So any questions? Uh, good. So I, it, yeah. Um, uh, so in order to write O of y is, is equal to this, I ha so I have to be very careful here. I, here, to, to write this equals this, um, I had to assume that O, uh, is, uh, um, uh, o is Hermitian um, at zero dilatation time. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's fine. Um, so, it, it, so this would follow, right? Ne never mind. Let, let's 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 ignore this. Uh, ignore this. It's not it's not subtle. Think about it, and uh, uh, and um, uh, and it should be clear. What's that? I can't hear you. Yes. You're asking about the p nu k mu term. Yeah, so I said what happens to that. Uh, so exercise. Um, figure out what happens to that term. Um, 
Good. OK, so um, uh, something to note. Um, so this, uh, in this computation, uh, we could have, um, um, so uh, the thing that we computed here can be thought of as an inner product um, of states. So uh, P nu acting on O, um, uh, inner product with uh, P mu acting on O. Um, and um, yeah, so this is, this is literally just equal to that expression. Um, and inner products should be positive definite uh, in refle reflection positive theory. Um, so uh, this gives us uh, a matrix, um, a d by d matrix that had better be positive definite. And we computed what that matrix was right here. This is just uh, 2 delta, uh, delta mu nu. Uh, and so from positive definiteness, we conclude that delta is bigger than or equal to 0. So this is something that I claimed on physical grounds earlier. Um, but here uh, you can see that it's a consequence um, of reflection positivity or unitarity of the theory. So we've derived both that delta is real and that it's bigger than or equal to 0. Um, uh, but you can do a bit better. So um, uh, here we got this constraint by just considering this particular state. Um, more generally, you could consider uh, many different types of states given by acting with some huge number of p's uh, on an operator O. And maybe O could have spin. Um, and you demand that uh, these norm squares have to be bigger than or equal to 0. Um, and this gives you uh, other kinds of constraints on delta. Um, and I won't have time to derive them for you, but I'll just write down uh, what the answer is. Um, so uh, the answer is that um, uh, for scalar operators, delta has to be bigger than or equal to d minus 2 over 2. So this would be for uh, L equals 0. Um, and for operators with spin, and for simplicity, I'll just write the answer for traceless symmetric tensors. Um, uh, delta has to be bigger than, than this value. So you get these values just by figuring out which state to look at um, and, and taking the norm of the appropriate state. Um, and uh, I should say, when these um, values are saturated, it means there exists a state of the form of a bunch of p's acting on O um, that is null. Um, and this, uh, this is actually physically interesting. So I'll, I'll show you in particular what these null states are. So in the, when uh, the first thing is saturated, um, the null state is p squared acting on a scalar operator, um, which means, so this equals 0. And um, uh, in terms of uh, the operator that you get by the state operator correspondence, this is just the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay? So um, this is saturated um, if and only if O um, is a free scalar operator. All its correlators satisfy the, the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, uh, the second case. Um, is saturated um, uh, when there's a null state of the following form. So O has to have spin. And um, the state that's null is where you act with one momentum and uh, contract it with one of the indices of O. Um, and this is a conserved current. So I probably should call it J instead of O. And this is just the equation d mu j mu mu 2 through mu L of x equals 0. OK, so, so when the unitarity bounds are saturated, those are physically interesting um, cases. All right. Yes. That, sorry, uh, yeah, so I'll just, uh, in the scalar case, this is saturated um, when, uh, yeah, when this satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, and uh, in this case, it's when this satisfies conservation. Um, and the difference, uh, differences between them, I guess, are that um, this equation is less constraining. It's, e it's easy to write down conformal correlators that involve um, these kinds of operators that satisfy this condition. 
at least for spin one and spin two. Um, uh, it turns out for higher spin, it's actually very constraining to have operators in the theory uh, with, with spin higher than two that satisfy this condition. Um, and um, their uh, correlators of these things have been explored a little bit. And there's a theorem that in three-dimensional CFTs, if you have higher spin symmetries of this form, then the theory is free. Um, and uh, there's, it's expected that there's a similar theorem um, in, in other space-time dimensions above two. Um, so, yeah, it's just a question of how constraining the conditions are. Um, and this condition is, is uh, also very constraining. It just implies that all the correlators are those of a free, uh, a free theory for this particular operator. So there could be other operators in the theory that have interesting correlators, but that just describes a decoupled CFT from the free, uh, the free boson. Other questions? OK. Um, yes? Yes, that's right. Actually, that's a very nice point. So thank you, thank you for mentioning that. So, so this is an if and only if. Um, uh, if. If you have an operator that satisfies this conservation equation, um, then um, uh, that, is, uh, that implies that the unitarity bound is saturated, because there's a null state. Um, so in particular, you, you get immediately that conformal symmetry implies that the dimension of conserved currents is fixed. In particular, uh, conformal symmetry fixes the dimension of the stress tensor to be d and the dimension of, uh, of conserved spin 1 currents to be d minus 1, which is what we expect. They, so they, they have the canonical scaling dimension. Um, good. OK. So. Um, We've been looking at states in radio quantization that you get by acting with an operator, uh, with a single local operator. Um, so it's natural to ask what kind of state you get by acting with more than one operator. Um, so let's act with uh, OJ at 0 and OI at x uh, and do the path integral. So in equations, this is OI of x, OJ of 0, acting on the vacuum in radial quantization. Um, and uh, um, good. So this gives us some state in, in radial quantization. Um, now, uh, um, you can show that um, all states, uh, all states in radial quantization in a unitary theory with a finite partition function on S d minus 1 cross S1, uh, all states are linear combinations of primaries and descendants. Okay, so I showed you what primaries and descendants were, but I didn't, uh, um, I didn't show uh, that that's all there, all there was. But it turns out that these two conditions are enough. Um, and please ask me afterwards if you're interested in hearing why. Um, but um, for now, we'll just uh, assume that all states are linear combinations of primaries and descendants. Um, and what this means is that this particular state that you get in this way, uh, we should be able to write it as uh, uh, some particular linear combination. Um, so that means uh, that we're going to have a sum over other operators in the theory. And this, k, this sum k is going to run over primary operators. And then I'm going to package together um, uh, primaries and descendants using uh, some differential operator. OK, so remember that, um, so, so for example, this thing will have some expansion that looks like, um, uh, say, well, so there'll be x to some power, there'll be 1, and then there'll be a term that looks like x dot uh, dy plus uh, x squared dot dy squared, and so on. And remember that um, derivatives uh, with respect to y are just the same as, um, as acting with momentum. Okay? So this is a, a particular way of packaging together um, the primary. This thing just gives the primary. Um, together with uh, descendants of the primary. So this is just a way of writing this claim that all states are linear combinations of primaries and descendants. Um, uh, so this gives an equation between states. Um, but we can use states as operators um, in a conformal field theory. So we could write it just uh, as an operator equation.
Um, and when we write this equation, uh, we have to um, be careful. Uh, so this, uh, so it's really this equation that's correct. Um, and in order to make sense of this, it was important that there were no other operators inside this ball that we're doing the path integral over. If there were, then we'd simply be talking about a different state in radio quantization. Okay, um, so that means we can use this equation um, if uh, other operators are outside the ball. So I should write here that there's, um, uh, there's a caveat that this operator equation is valid if other operators um, have uh, x minus x1 bigger than x2 minus x1. Uh, sorry, I wrote it wrong. It should be x minus, uh, yeah, x minus x2 is bigger than x1 minus x2. Um, so um, this, is, this is already not that uh, restrictive, um, but uh, it, it turns out that you can do a little better. So there's a, a slightly different form of the OPE that I won't bother writing down, um, uh, but uh, it's easy to explain physically why it exists. So this idea of expanding a product of operators uh, in terms of a single operator at a point, um, this construction makes it clear that we can do it whenever we can draw any sphere that surrounds the two operators. This is exactly what I'm saying. That, no, 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 this is exactly what I'm saying now. These are the sentences I'm saying now. Okay, so. So yes, yeah, so so um, that's right. So this is this is uh, one version of the OPE where I put one of the operators at the origin, but you can, as Zohar says, you can get a less restrictive version of the OPE where you have um, uh, two of the operators um, and maybe you have other operator insertions, um, and you can do the OPE whenever it's possible to find any sphere that surrounds um, these two operators and separates them from all the others. Okay. So that OPE looks slightly different because um, the two operators there are not both the center of this sphere that I drew. Uh, but I won't bother writing that explicitly because I won't need it uh, for this course. But, um, but it's useful to keep in mind. So, so this means that being able to do the OPE is actually uh, not a very restrictive thing at all. So for example, you could consider a configuration of four points um, that looks like this. Um, uh, and here, it's completely valid to do the OPE by drawing a huge circle, almost degenerate circle, uh, that separates these two points from these two points. And this will give you a perfectly convergent OPE expansion um, that uh, is completely valid. Um, OK, good. Questions? Yeah, good, thank you. So I'm being very schematic. Yes, you're absolutely right. There are, are coefficients here, and those coefficients are very important. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, sorry, can you, can you speak uh, six times louder? Um, good. So, so the square of an operator um, is not uh, it, um, uh, the square of an operator is not in general well defined in a CFT. You take two operators close to each other, you'll have singularities. Um, but you're asking why are why why can we expand this in a linear combination of primaries and descendants? Um, and I I did not prove that. Uh, I said we're going to assume that. Um, and uh, if I have time afterwards, I'll, I'll give a proof. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. Composite operators, good. So a composite operator is a perfectly good primary operator if it's if it's primary. 
So I would say that's just a separate operator. Um, so yes, so sometimes you can, you can take two operators and bring them together and there are no singularities. Or maybe you can subtract out the singularities and that defines a new operator. But that's just a new operator, some other operator. So in this sum, absolutely, I would include phi and phi squared and phi to the fourth and phi to the ninth and phi to the trillion. And they're all separate, separate terms. Good. So yeah, so this sum would go over all of those different things. Good. Uh, other questions? Um, okay, so yes, so thank you for, um, thank you for pointing out these coefficients. Um, those, those are very important. I haven't said what those are yet. Um, but uh, it turns out that they're fixed by conformal invariance. So conformal invariance fixes this differential operator. Um, and the way to see that is to take this equation um, and take its correlator with another operator. All right. So on the left-hand side, we're going to have a three-point function, oi of x1, oj of x2, ok of x3. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have a sum over k, this differential operator, cijk of x12, D2. Um, uh, actually, let me make this sum over k prime. Um, and then a two point function, uh, O k prime of, um, uh, of x2, O k of x3. All right, um, but uh, good. So, but we know a lot of things in this formula. So first of all, we know the left-hand side because we saw that conformal invariance fixes three-point functions. So this is just f i j k over x one two to the delta one plus delta two minus uh, or delta i plus delta j minus delta k times permutations. Okay, that was a formula that uh, we wrote in a previous lecture. Um, and we also know two-point functions. Um, and uh, for simplicity, let's pick a basis of operators um, that is orthonormal for the two-point functions. Okay, so this two-point function will just be a Kronecker delta, delta k, k prime, over x2, 3 uh, to the 2, delta k. So the left-hand side we know. On the right-hand side, we have our differential operator acting on something that's known. Um, and by matching both sides, we can fix the form of this thing. So this is, uh, um, this is an exercise that I highly recommend. This is one of the more, probably more important exercises in this course. So let's look at the special case where delta i equals delta j equals some delta phi. Um, and uh, delta k I'll call just delta. So show that cijk of x comma d is fijk this three-point coefficient times uh, the following. So uh, x to the delta minus 2 delta phi times this expansion that has interesting coefficients in it, 1 half x dot dx plus a coefficient alpha Okay, so you should um, derive this one half, and uh, if you're if you're interested, you can also derive uh, what these coefficients are, alpha and beta. Okay, so this is an example 
of um, what this differential operator looks like. Um, and uh, this structure is, um, uh, is uh, we can understand certain pieces of the structure very easily. So this power of x um, is determined by um, dimensional analysis. So oi uh, has length dimension minus delta i. oj has length dimension minus delta j. Um, and ok has length dimension minus delta k. So you can see you need x to the appropriate power out front in order to make the dimensions match. Um, and then all of these terms have to be x times uh, ddx uh, so that they're dimensionless. Okay? So the dimension of this thing is, is just fixed by uh, dimensional analysis. Um, and another way to understand that, a more formal way to understand that, is to imagine taking this equation um, and acting with the dilatation operator on both sides. So that's a fancy way of saying we're doing dimensional analysis. Um, and if you do that, you should get some consistency condition on this differential operator, which amounts to precisely the statement that dimensional analysis works. Um, but another more interesting thing to do is to take this equation and act with other conformal generators, in particular the special conformal generators, K. Um, if you act with those on both sides, that gives another way of recovering why all these coefficients are fixed. Um, and that's another exercise that you can do if you like. Um, it's a little bit uh, less, um, less clear than simply matching the, uh, the three-point function on the left-hand side, but it's a, a completely equivalent thing to do and gives another way of understanding why this whole thing is fixed by conformal invariance. Questions? Yes, good. Um, that's right. So, um, uh, right. So, in these coefficients, um, you'll have uh, you have uh, infinity um, if if delta is uh, a free field. Um, and um, the way to understand that is um, you can't have uh, so what, what should happen, what you should be seeing is that you can't have a free field appearing in the OPE of things that aren't, uh, aren't also related to free fields. You don't see it here. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, it, yeah, I agree. It's not, it's, I, don't, I don't see it clearly here uh, either. But zero over zero. Uh, good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you don't see it. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, yeah. So, so Zohar was noting this uh, this funny factor delta minus uh, d minus two over two, um, and actually the fact that um, uh, the the Quantities appearing in the denominators here have physical significance. We'll see later um, that they're related to um, norms of descendant states. Um, and so in particular, in a unitary theory, they're always going to be positive because uh, the unitarity bounds came from demanding that all descendant states have positive norms. So we'll see why that is in, in a moment. Um, but um, good. So, so everything here was just using basic consistency condition, ba basic conditions on local quantum field theories, um, together with the symmetries um, that we have uh, in a conformal field theory. Um, but what we end up with is actually something quite remarkable. Um, so, uh, once you know these differential operators. Uh, you can, of course, compute three-point functions in this way. You could imagine starting with this three-point function, uh, doing the OPE between these two guys, and reducing it to two-point functions. Um, but actually, you can do this with any endpoint correlator. So these, uh, the OPE gives an algorithm for computing any endpoint correlation function um, in a conformal field theory in flat space. So if you imagine starting with some endpoint function, O1 of x1 through On of xn, um, and let me actually give myself some more room. So I'll write O2 explicitly. Uh, we can pair up the operators and do the OP between them. Um, and this gives uh, a sum 
over these differential operators uh, times uh, n minus 1 point functions. Um, and uh, by recursing, you can reduce the whole thing to one point functions, if you like. And these are extremely simple in a CFT. Um, they're just one for the unit operator uh, and zero otherwise. Um, and this is, a, this is a consequence of dimensional analysis. There's just no scales in the theory, so there's absolutely nothing you can write here. Yes? Yeah. Good. So that that's that's definitely always going to be the case. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I I feel confident saying that you can always find a sphere that surrounds two of the points, but uh, but not the others. Um. Uh, let me just note. So so um, the OPE. Uh, so we can use it to compute a vast number of observables in flat space. But you can actually also use it on any conformally flat manifold. Um, the reason is because if you have a conformally flat manifold, you can do some vial rescaling so that the region where, where your operators are looks flat. Um, and, uh, and then you can just think of that part of the path integral. It just looks like it's in flat space. Um, and you can do the OPE in that flat region. Um, the only thing that changes is this condition um, uh, that now the one-point functions on non-trivial manifolds can be non-zero. So for example, um, in a thermal CFT uh, on R d minus 1 cross S1, you can have one-point functions of operators that are proportional to uh, beta to the minus delta, where beta is the, uh, is the length of the thermal circle. Okay? So if you have operators um, in a thermal CFT, um, uh, you can do the OPE between them and, and compute uh, the, their endpoint functions if you know all the thermal one-point functions. Um, there is a bit of a caveat that you can only do this if the operators are sufficiently close um, so that you can, you can surround them all with a, with a flat sphere. And this means they have to be closer than the, uh, than the radius of the, of the thermal circle. But um, anyway, so, so uh, the... I, I just wanted to say that the, the OPE is, is an extremely powerful tool. And as long as you're interested in um, theories on conformally flat manifolds, um, it, it gives you a, a huge class of observables. Yes? Um, that's right. So, so, so the problem is that we just hadn't used uh, the full consequences of conformal invariance at that point. So the, the, the obvious word identities, it's true, they did not fix the four-point function. But actually, if you know the, the structure of the OPE, then it turns out the four-point function is completely fixed. Yes? Right. Yes. So um, if you have a massive theory um, and you're interested in correlators where all the points are, are very close to each other, um, then, uh, then you can do this. And there's a systematic way to correct the OPE using uh, conformal perturbation theory. Um, so, uh, so yes. So you can write down systematic corrections um, in um, uh, Distance scale times mass, um, which will which will give you valid results as long as that product is small. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, what I that's what I mean. So so there are two things that happen when you when you have a massive theory and you try to do these computations. Um, one is you have to correct uh, the structure of the OPE. 
And that you can do reliably in conformal perturbation theory, um, uh, as long as the points are close to each other. The other thing that happens uh, is much more difficult to deal with. And it's that operators can now have non-zero one-point functions, again, in the massive theory. And the one-point functions have non-perturbative information about the RG flow in them. You cannot compute the one-point functions using conformal perturbation theory. You need some other technique. Some of the some of the ground That's right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, um, uh, but, but you can, um, uh, in some cases, people are actually able to compute one-point functions. Um, and so there's some, there, there's, uh, a very nice paper by um, Zamolajikov and some others where they basically do this procedure um, in the 2D icing model deformed by a relevant um, uh, coupling and they're able to compute um, the two-point function uh, essentially at all distance scales. So they do this procedure that I just described to, to get a handle on the short distance behavior and then there's some form factor expansion that they can use at long distances and they can get the whole thing to match and just plot the two-point function to very high precision in a completely uh, massive uh, quantum field theory. Other questions? Yes, good. So yes, I, I, the four-point function is fixed if you know um, all the things uh, appearing in um, in the OPE. And, then, and, and that means you need to know um, the three-point function coefficients, f, i, j, k, um, and the dimensions. Um, and if you know that, then everything else is fixed. I, I can't hear you. Sorry. It seems that what? Yes. If, if you're worried, if beta is small, then. Oh, this, this beta. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's right. So, so yeah, so as Zohar noted, so this, this will blow up when delta is a free field, when, when O is a, a, a free operator, right? This, remember, this was our unitarity bound um, that said that uh, this, um, uh, if delta O is equal to d minus 2 over 2, then this is 0, right? So as Zohar noted, that uh, that beta goes with this term, and there's a del squared, so, it's, so you actually get 0, um, 0 there. And um, I think, um, um, uh, I think the, the resolution of this 0 um, probably uh, depends you probably have to be careful with whether that's 0 over 0 is something finite or not. Um, uh, yeah, so for example, in a free theory, it, it's not going to be infinity. It will never be infinity. But in a free theory, it could be something finite, because you could have phi appearing on, in the OPE of, of other operators. Yes. Yes. So, so the, so the OPE doesn't require the points to be uh, arbitrarily close. Um, all you have to do is be able to draw a sphere that separates two points from the other uh, from the other points. Um, so, so let me show you how to do that um, in 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 the case you were describing. So, uh, if we have uh, the operators at zero, one, um, and infinity, uh, and then z. Um, then uh, if I want to do this OPE, it suffices to draw any sphere that separates these two. So let me draw this big giant sphere that has a center over there. That works, so now I can do this OPE. What about, what about this one? Well, in this case, I guess I could draw this sphere. That works, so I can do this OPE. Um, uh, what, about, what about this one and that one? Well, OK, I can draw this big giant sphere that's centered 
all the way over there. So I can do that OPE also. And actually, it turns out that um, uh, so one thing you can do to help yourself is um, you can do conformal transformations um, and then try to find spheres. Um, and, and that will also give you, uh, I'll tell you when you can do the OPE. Um, and it turns out for four points, you can always do the OPE between any two of the points, uh, no matter what. Um, there's a, there's a co-dimension one space in, in, uh, in the space of cross ratios where you, where you can't, but, but everywhere outside of that. For generic configurations of points, you can do the OPE between any pair. Good. So, so yes. Yeah. So, so the convergence is always exponential. Uh, the convergence is always r to the delta, where uh, delta is the dimension of the operator appearing in the OPE. Um, and r is something that depends on the configuration of the points. r is always less than 1, uh, but there's a question of how big it is. So if you're in one of these very degenerate looking configurations where you have these two points here and you draw this big giant circle and you're doing the OPE, then r will be very close to 1. So um, it'll take a while, and then it'll start to converge exponentially anyway. I haven't defined R, but hopefully we'll be able to define it at some point. <laughs> I'll tell you what R is. Um, so uh, so what, what, what you do, you can define, um, uh, so R is equal to the absolute value of Z over um, 1 plus root 1 minus Z squared, where Z is the usual cross ratio that, uh, that, that you would define. What's that? Um, right. So, so this 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 gives the radius of convergence for um, the best way of doing the OPE. Um, so the yeah, I I I don't I don't really I don't particularly want to get into the uh, to that subtlety at this point. But okay, well, maybe, maybe I'll explain it. So, um, so I said before that you're allowed to do conformal transformations first before doing the OPE, right? Because the correlator, we know how it transforms under conformal transformations of all the points. So the idea is to pick a conformal transformation that makes the OPE converge uh, as well as possible. So in the case of the four-point function, um, it turns out that the thing you should do, let's say you want to do the OPE between points one and two, then you should Apply a conformal transformation um, so that um, 3 and 4 lie on the unit circle, um, and 1 and 2 are at diametrically opposite points. Um, and r is this radius. So uh, this is, uh, if we have four points, we can always apply a conformal transformation to bring them to this configuration. Once you have them in this configuration and you do the OP between 1 and 2, it will converge uh, as fast as possible. So that, that's the best conformal transformation to do um, for theories above two dimensions. Good. So, um, okay. So we have an algorithm for evaluating uh, any endpoint function. So let's let's use it in an example. Um, and the example that we'll take is a four-point function of identical scalars. Um, and let's evaluate this by pairing up the operators like this and doing the OP between them. Um, and this gives a sum. It's a double sum over operators appearing in this OPE and operators appearing in this OPE. So O and O prime. Um, we get um, uh, an OPE coefficient, F phi phi O. Another OPE coefficient, F phi phi O prime. Um, then we have the differential operator coming from this OPE. 
and the differential operator coming from the other OPE. Um, and then a two-point function uh, of O and O prime. Um, now, I, I lied a little bit earlier. Um, it, it turns out these, uh, so I ignored, specifically, I ignored the case uh, where the uh, operators um, have spin. So operators can have spin. And when that happens, you can still do, do the OPE, but, but the differential operator now has indices. So in particular, if you have two scalar operators and you're doing the OPE between them, you can have operators with spin appearing in the scalar scalar OPE. Um, and so I'll indicate that by uh, giving, uh, giving some indices to these operators O and O prime. Um, so A is an, a general SOD index, and you can think of it as a collection of uh, of mu indices, symmetrized traceless mu indices. Okay, so this is the more general thing that we can have. Um, and uh, good, so we did two OPEs and we re reduced this to a two point function. Um, and now two point functions are fixed in conformal field theory. Um, there's some tensor structure uh, over the separation between the points uh, to twice the dimension. Um, and I, I haven't written this tensor structure for you yet. Uh, Zohar derived it in the case of spin 2 operators uh, in his talk today. Um, but just as an example, I'll write it for spin 1 operators. So this is uh, delta mu nu minus 2 x mu x nu over x squared. So this is an example. Um, and, uh, and basically using this object, you can, you can write down the, the general uh, tensor structure for spin L operators. But the point is just that it's fixed. It's something known. Um, so all of the quantities here, uh, um, uh, at least this quantity, this differential operator, this differential operator, and this two-point function, we know. They're fixed by conformal invariance. Oh, and I should say, um, again, here it's useful to pick an orthonormal basis of operators um, so that O and O prime have zero two point function unless they're the same. Um, so this double sum over O and O prime, because of the Kronecker delta, collapses to a single sum. And so our four point function becomes a sum over operators O in the phi phi OPE, a squared OPE coefficient times some stuff and this stuff is completely fixed by conformal invariance um, and uh, we define it to be some function of the points and conventionally, we pull out this, uh, these factors. Um, and this thing here is called a conformal block. Um, it's completely fixed by the symmetries of the theory. Um, in terms of the dimension um, uh, of O and the spin of O, and in general, it could also dimension. It could also depend on um, on uh, on delta phi as well. It turns out in this case it doesn't, um, but in, in general, uh, uh, it could. So for now, yeah, G is just a function of the xi. For the moment. Um, and so just to emphasize, we know all these objects. So uh, as an exercise, show that in the case of a scalar operator, so when L equals 0, so by the way, this is the dimension of O and the spin, spin of O. So for uh, when O ha has dimension delta and L is 0, 
then this conformal block, which in general is a function of, the, of the, all the positions, is uh, this cross ratio u to the delta over 2 times uh, uh, plus higher orders. In, uh, in U. Okay, so use the form of the, uh, of the OPE um, uh, from the exercise a few minutes ago. Uh, use the known form of this two point function for scalar operators um, and derive the leading term in the conformal block. Okay? So, um, This leads me to your question, uh, back to your question, about what the conformal block depends on. So I've been writing it. So far, all we know is that it has uh, some general dependence on the points xi. But uh, actually, it turns out that um, uh, this is not an accident, that it comes out to just be a function of the conformal cross ratios. Um, actually, g is, uh, is just a function of the, of the conformal cross ratios. U and V. Um, and it's, it's completely non-obvious from this definition. But it turns out that if you take into account the full structure of these differential operators, um, then everything resums up um, seemingly magically to give a function of U and V. Uh, and it's instructive to understand why uh, that happens. So that's what I'll talk about next. But uh, let me pause for a second and ask again if there are any questions. Can you compute the sum as a perturbative expansion? Yes. Yeah, so, so this naturally gives you the sum as a perturbative expansion in small x1, x12, uh, and x34. Um, or, so this, will, this structure naturally gives it to you as a perturbative expansion in u. And you'll find that out if you, if you, uh, if you do the exercise. Um, yeah, I mean, it's because these, these uh, differential operators are already uh, uh, um, uh, a power series expansion in this parameter here, right? Other questions? Ten minutes. Um, okay, okay, ten minutes. Fifteen. Can I can I get a <laughs> can I get a twenty? Um, okay. So 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 why? Uh, why is this the case? And understanding why will give us a way to compute these conformal blocks. So this, this is a way you could compute them, um, uh, but it's, it's a nightmare. It's a giant mess. So it turns out there's something much more efficient that we can do. Um, so let's look again at our four-point function um, in radial quantization. So we're going to do this thing that I said before about going back and forth between um, uh, the operator picture and, and radial quantization. Um, so this is our four-point function. And in writing this expression, I'm assuming there's a particular radial, radial ordering for the points. So x1 is closer to the origin than x2 and, and so on. Um, it won't be so important, but, but if you like, we can assume that, that ordering. Um, and between the pairs of operators, um, we can insert a resolution of the identity as a sum over projectors onto the conformal multiplet of some operator O. So by this projector, um, I mean what you should do is sum over primaries and descendants of O. Okay, so alpha and beta run over O, and all possible ways of acting on O with momenta and contracting the momentum indices and so on. Um, and we're going to we're build a projection operator out of this. So there's alpha and beta. Um, and then the inverse of their norms. So n alpha beta is inner product of alpha with beta. Okay, so these are the states in a single conformal multiplet, and this just projects onto them. Um, and my claim earlier that all states in the theory were linear combinations of primaries and descendants is equivalent to the statement that 1 is equal to the sum over all the primaries in the theory 
of these projectors. Um, so these projectors are nice objects because they play nicely with the conformal symmetries of the theory. So by construction, the conformal generators commute with these projection operators. So this means that an individual term in the sum Um, this object satisfies all the same word identities as a four-point function. Why is that? Well, so we start acting with differential operators on this thing. Then we get um, these uh, generators of the conformal group. We get commutators of these things with the various operators. Um, and because they commute with this projector, they really don't care at all about the presence of this projector. So anything that we could derive for a four-point function uh, in a conformal field theory, we will also derive for this object. And in particular, that implies that it has the form of a four-point function. It's some function of u and v over x12 to the 2 delta phi, uh, x34 to the 2 delta phi. Um, and this function is exactly our conformal block. Um, and, what, and because I'm actually doing this in a particular theory, there will also be uh, the squared OP coefficients there that I have to strip off. Okay, So uh, you should convince yourself um, that this conformal block, this definition of the conformal block, is equivalent to that definition of the conformal block. Um, and you can see that by taking this thing and doing the OPE uh, in here. So I recommend, I recommend that exercise. Um, uh, going back and forth between these two pictures is nice. This picture makes it extremely explicitly clear um, uh, that there exists an object that's fixed by conformal symmetry and that can be computed in a concrete way. Um, and this picture makes it clear what word identities it satisfies, in particular that it's a function of u and v. Um, this picture, yes? Yes. Um, no, no. Uh, so, I mean, um, uh, good. So, so if you like uh, a picture um, that you could draw um, is that, um, so we have uh, one and two inside the unit circle. Um, and alpha and beta are living on the unit circle. And then three and four are outside. Um, so maybe no was, was the wrong answer. Maybe I should have said yes. And that, there, there's a picture that you, can, that you can keep in mind. Other questions? OK. Um, good. So this picture, this radio quantization picture, also makes clear uh, a more efficient way to compute these things. Um, and the idea is to write down a differential equation um, using, uh, using the word identities that it satisfies. So in particular, we can look at the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group. Um, this object has the property that uh, if you act with C on any alpha that is a, a primary O or a descendant of O, um, then it, you just get some eigenvalue times the same alpha. This eigenvalue depends on delta and L. Um, so lambda delta L is minus delta times delta minus D plus L times L uh, plus D minus 2. Um, and in particular, this means that C uh, when you act on either side of O uh, of this projector onto the conformal multiplet of O gives this same eigenvalue. 
Um, and we can use this to get a differential equation for the conformal block. Um, so, so how does this work? So first note that if you take the differential operators acting on the points 1 and 2, and you take the sum of them and you act on these two operators, 5x1, 5x2, this is equal to LAB commutator with 5x1, 5x2. Um, and so if we do this twice, Um, on this pair of operators, we just get um, that. And so now, if we take this uh, this big differential operator. Um, which I'll call curly D. Um, if we act with curly D on this uh, conformal block object, basically what it does is it acts on phi one, five uh, x one, and five x two um, to give this commutator. The terms where the LABs act on the vacuum just give zero. So you just get the terms where the LABs are on the left. Um, and that's just the same thing with the Casimir sitting there next to the projector. And so this just gives our eigenvalue times this object. OK? So this thing satisfies a second order differential equation. Uh, and if you take that differential equation, um, you can write it in terms uh, of this. Just plug in that, that this equals this thing. Uh, you'll get a differential equation for the conformal block um, that will just depend on u and v. Um, so this gives a second order differential equation for g delta l of u and v. Um, and together with the boundary condition uh, that you will derive in your exercise, um, and actually in the exercise you just do the case of a scalar, um, it turns out that for an operator with spin, instead of delta over 2, you get delta minus l over 2. Uh, together with this boundary condition, you can solve the differential equation and get the conformal block. And so this is a trick that was uh, introduced by Dolan and Osborne in 2001. Um, and let me conclude by showing you uh, what they found. So uh, for two-dimensional CFTs, this is a formula that was probably known for ages before them, but it, you can get it from this method. So the 2D conformal block uh, has the following form. Uh, and I'll explain uh, what this notation means in a second. 4D conformal block uh, looks similar. Um, so what are these things? So uh, I'm using the, uh, 
the nice coordinates that we've talked about before. U is ZZ bar and V is 1 minus Z, 1 minus Z bar. And this K function is a hypergeometric function. Um, so Dolan and Osborne wrote down this differential equation and solved it um, uh, in uh, two, four, and six dimensions. I'm not writing the six-dimensional formula because it's, it's, not, it's not quite as nice looking, but it's equally explicit. Um, and so you get these, uh, just these nice combinations of special functions. So it's extremely concrete. Um, and uh, this is conformal representation theory. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's very, it's very non-trivial consequence of, of conformal representation theory. Um, in, uh, in odd dimensions, um, uh, there do not exist known expressions for the conformal blocks in terms of elementary functions like this. Um, but uh, they're equally, uh, equally well computable. For example, from the conformal Casimir equation, uh, you can compute them uh, in a power series expansion, um, if you like, to whatever order you like. So um, uh, they're, uh, they're also very concrete, but just can't be written in terms of these simple functions. Any questions? This is a good point to end. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's pretty much where I wanted to get to today. So I'll I'll.